uh, greetings. Uh, this is uh, Raju uh, from the University of uh, Texas, MD Anderson Cancer Center. I've been uh, looking forward to this trip to Australia to be with you all and uh, be part of this great course. I'm uh, very sorry I cannot make it in person and I look forward to learning from the very best in the field during this course. Thank you, Raj, Phil, and Norio. So my topic today is uh, dysplasia in IBD. How do you detect it, characterize it, and resect it? I am not an expert in this field, so I requested the slide set from my good friend Roy Setikno, who has done a lot of great work along with uh, Tanya Kaltenbach, Ken McWade, and Sylvia. So I'm using these slides and made some modifications to best fit for this uh, lecture. Let me take you back and share with you what we used to do when I was a fellow in training in the early 1990s. At that time, we realized that it is important to do surveillance examination for patients with long-standing disease, especially those with pancolitis, either from ulcerative colitis or Crohn's with a duration of 8 to 10 years. That's when we started doing colonoscopy. That stands true even today. The only difference from what we do today is that at that time we used to take random biopsies, four quadrants, every three to seven centimeters starting from the cecum all the way to the distal part of the rectum. So when you ask about what is the impact of this surveillance method using multiple biopsies of the colon, I will take you through a case. Here is a patient where biopsies were done. Biopsies came back as nothing remarkable. And then down the road, the patient developed colon cancer, as you can see here. The biopsies did miss the lesion that you have seen here. That's the area that should have been biopsied, but the biopsy went a little bit further up, and then that was missed, and the patient ended up with cancer. So there is a problem with targeted biopsies. I would like to take you through a turning point in the surveillance of patients with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's colitis. And this was the effort of a family, the Maxine and, and Zach Zaro Family Foundation and William Karen Foundation. This family lost one of their loved ones and reached out to Roy Sitikno to come up and help do a better job. Roy, working with Ken McWade, former president of the ASGE, and his colleague Tanya Kaltenbach, invited several experts from all over the United States as well as in the rest of the world and brought them together to develop the scenic international consensus statement on surveillance and management of dysplasia in inflammatory bowel disease. This was published both in GIE and gastroenterology way back in 2015. I would like to review this uh, document because this, this forms the basis for what we do today. So what did we learn? 
We learned that dysplasia in IBD takes to a different form, that is more flat lesions than protruding lesions and random biopsies are not very good. They detect dysplasia in about 9 out of 100 patients. In contrast, they have shown that if you use chromoendoscopy with targeted biopsies, the yield jumps up significantly to the tune of over 90 out of 100. So we are going to talk about chromoendoscopy in the next few slides. It is also interesting to note that in this large analysis of eight colonoscopy studies, including over 700 patients, the numbers needed to treat to find a patient with at least one dysplasia is 14. So the yield is pretty good. So this is what we should be doing in managing our patients with long-term IBD. So how do we screen IBD in 2020? The first step is excellent bowel preparation. Patients should be instructed about taking a low residue diet and take all the prep on the same day of the procedure, four to six hours before the procedure, or doing a split dose, the first dose the evening before and the second dose four to six hours before the procedure time. We should stay away from the single overnight dose with a long waiting period of 10 to 12 hours before the procedure because that does not give good preparation. The next step is when you use an endoscope, you should learn about the iris mode. There are two modes, the peak mode and the average slash auto mode. The auto mode provides excellent view, especially the long view. But when you go close up, it can create halation which limits your ability to detect. And when you cl come close up, you should change to a peak mode, peak mode, so that you avoid the halation and have a great close up view. This is a concept that you should keep in mind. The next step is having a cap at the end of the scope helps you detect lesions that are across the bend. As you can see here on the left versus the right, the cap actually allows to flatten the fold and gives you the ability to recognize that. Coming to the chromoendoscopy, we all struggle to come up with the right uh, mixture and this is the best slide that you should keep in mind or maybe take a photograph now if you want to. For detection or surveillance exam, exam, you put two ampules of either indigo carmine or methylene blue. If indigo carmine is not available, in 250 ml of water, and you could use water jet to actually flush and examine the colon. When you find a lesion that you think that there is possibility that there is a lesion and you want to have a detailed viewing, then you use a little more concentrated solution. You add one ampule of indigo carmine in 25 cc of water and you get a much darker solution. It will define the borders much better. In contrast to these stronger dilutions, for submucosal injection, we use a very light dilution 10 drops in 100 cc of saline so that you could see the letters on the back side of the syringe. So this is something to keep in mind. I would like to next share with you a beautiful video produced by Roy Sotikno, Tanya Kaltenbach, and Ken McWade. 
a chromoendoscopy with targeted biopsies. First, whenever possible, the disease should be in remission before surveillance is undertaken. Active colitis causes changes in mucosal color, texture, and vascularity that can be extremely difficult to distinguish from non-polypoid neoplasia. Furthermore, mucosal inflammation and regeneration can cause cytological changes that can mimic dysplasia. An excellent bowel prep is a prerequisite for IVD surveillance. Suboptimal preps may obscure non-polypoid lesions. All remaining residues should be meticulously washed. After complete insertion of the colonoscope, examination with chromoendoscopy begins in the cecum and proceeds methodically. During withdrawal, each segment is sprayed and carefully inspected. Excess indigo carmine solution is suctioned so that a thin layer remains and the mucosa is not obscured by blue pools. Lesions seen on chromoendoscopy are examined in closely to determine their border and their endoscopic resectability. This is a patient with quiescent UC undergoing routine surveillance. A slightly elevated lesion is poorly visualized with high definition imaging in a region involved with colitis. Upon application of dilute indigo carmine, a large flat neoplasm is well seen, which has discrete margins and it appears to be much larger than initially predicted by white light imaging. The lesion was felt to be endoscopically resectable and was removed with ESD. Histology confirmed low-grade dysplasia. Endoscopists with less experience in EMR or ESD may consider referral to a more experienced endoscopist or to a surgeon after patient discussion. In contrast to the prior case, this lesion has several features that indicate that it is not endoscopically resectable. It's poorly circumscribed, has an indistinct border, and has an irregular plaque-like surface with a depressed center. Biopsies confirmed high-grade dysplasia. Surgery is the best treatment. In addition to enhancing the border, chromoendoscopy makes it easier to examine the mucosal surface of lesions. Under high-definition imaging, endoscopists can discriminate between inflammatory polyps, serrated lesions, and lesions with low-grade dysplasia, high-grade dysplasia, or invasive cancer. It is unnecessary to biopsy or remove obvious inflammatory polyps or lesions, such as seen here. But, when in doubt, biopsies are recommended of all suspicious lesions to exclude dysplasia. This 35-year-old male with indeterminate colitis had a one centimeter polypoid lesion within a colitic area. Biopsies excluded dysplasia and confirmed chronic inflammation. In this patient with long-standing chronic UC, dilute indigo carmine demonstrates a large, well-defined sessile lesion. The surface shows familiar features that resemble an adenoma. This lesion was removed by EMR and confirmed to have low-grade dysplasia. In this patient with chronic colitis, two well-demarcated, slightly raised lesions are readily identified. On close-up view, the lesion resembles a villus adenoma. The lesions also were resected with EMR and confirmed high-grade dysplasia. Non-polypoid lesions occurring within clitic areas may be removed endoscopically provided they are well circumscribed and do not have features suggesting obvious cancer with local invasion. Whenever possible, non-polypoid lesions less than two centimeters in size should be resected in one piece, i.e. on block, using EMR. Following a resection, the mucosa around the site should be biopsied to exclude the presence of unrecognized flat dysplasia, which would usually require subsequent definitive surgical resection. In this patient with chronic colitis, a sessile lesion was identified with chromoendoscopy at 6 o'clock. Upon closer inspection, this sessile lesion was felt to have features suspicious for invasive malignancy. That is, the center of the lesion is depressed and the surface is amorphous with loss of mucosal detail. Hence, decisions pertaining to endoscopic versus surgical resectability were deferred pending biopsy results. Biopsy should be targeted the most concerning area of the lesion as shown here, which confirmed invasive cancer. Surgical resection demonstrated a T1N0. 
So let's talk about uh, some of the limitations of chromoendoscopy. Uh, this can be a problem when you're looking at patients with a segment of colon with multiple large pseudopolyps and in patients with a stricture in the setting of ulcerative colitis. So let me show you some examples. Here is a segment with multiple pseudopolyps and in this segment it is very hard to figure out if there is an associated dysplastic lesion in the surrounding area. Another example of a, a stricture in the colon and hard to figure out whether the area that's abnormal is actually ongoing inflammation or development of a dysplastic pathology. So these are the limitations. So for the sake of uh, trainees here, what are the resources that are available? And uh, let me take a few minutes to talk about it. I recommend highly to go back and get this uh, document, the Scenic International Consensus Statement on Surveillance and Management of Dysplasia in Inflammatory Bowel Disease, published in GI Endoscopy in 2015. And this is a great resource with several tables about how to take care of patients with inflammatory bowel disease. There are also excellent resources on the ASGE Online Learning Center. Dr. Sitikno, Roy Sitikno created this beautiful DVD on chromoendoscopy with targeted biopsy to detect non-polypoid colorectal neoplasia in the setting of IBD. So he also has put in other resources that you could access. I would also urge you to listen to this beautiful uh, tip, uh, the video tip of the week uh, from Dr. Doug Rex on chromoendoscopy in IBD surveillance. This is a beautiful uh, video and you will learn a lot. In conclusion, uh, we have come a long way from random biopsies of the colon every few centimeters, transitioning to chromoendoscopy with targeted biopsies, and uh, we also recognize the IBD patients tend to have flat lesions, and the, man and the management of these lesions should follow the new scenic recommendations. I want to thank you all for this uh, opportunity, and I also want to take a few minutes to pray for all those who have been affected by the severe fire in Australia that's been going on for the last few days. Thank you.